All right, so this fireside chat will be moderated by Jim Sandman, who is on the faculty uh, of uh, University of Pennsylvania Law School. He is the president emeritus of the Legal Services a Corporation. Uh, while he was uh, the president, he was actually here giving a wonderful keynote a few years ago, which we all uh, remember very well. And uh, he's done a lot of great things uh, in his job at the Legal Services Corporation. Uh, before the Legal Services Corporation, he had a distinguished career as a um, private practitioner with Arnold and Porter in DC. And there's many, many more things to say, but we're running behind time. <laughs> so anyways, I'll turn it over to you, Jim. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for agreeing to chair this panel. Yes. Thank, you. thank you, Roland. It's great to be here. Uh, I'm Jim Sandman, and I'm our theme this afternoon is access to justice. We'd like to close with uh, some uh, big ideas and encourage you to be thinking big about how we might actually solve the access to justice problem in the United States. I'm joined by two big thinkers. Uh, to my immediate right is Lisa Dewey, who for more than 20 years has been the pro bono partner at DLA Piper, one of the largest law firms in the world. Uh, she was the first full-time pro bono partner at that firm, and she leads their uh, North American pro bono operations. I don't know of a law firm in the United States that has a bigger commitment to pro bono than DLA Piper. They think outside the box, and Lisa will be talking about some of the very innovative pro bono projects that they've undertaken on top of the usual type of pro bono work, that is representing low-income individuals in individual cases. And to Lisa's uh, right is Beth Henderson, who is Assistant General Counsel and Pro Bono Director at Microsoft. At Microsoft, Pro Bono Director is a full-time job. I don't know an American corporation that has a bigger commitment to Pro Bono than Microsoft does, and it comes from the top of the corporation. Uh, President Brad Smith at Microsoft has been personally involved in the corporation's pro bono uh, work for many years, and they too undertake projects that are big in, in scale. Uh, we think it's important to think big because the state of access to justice in the United States is in crisis. I believe that the civil justice system in the United States today is a five alarm fire, and we are using a bucket brigade to fight it. The conventional interventions that we have been using are too modest, too slow, and too diffuse to make a significant difference anytime soon. We are operating a legal system created for a world that ceased to exist sometime in the last quarter of the last century, a lawyer-centric world in which most cases involve two parties represented by lawyers. Ralph started us off this morning by talking about the astonishing statistic that in the United States today, in 76% of civil cases in state courts, at least one party does not have a lawyer. It wasn't always that way. That's a relatively recent development. The first earliest studies I've seen on this subject of self-represented litigants date from the mid-1970s, and the percentages at that point, the percentages of cases involving self-represented litigants range from the low single digits to a high of 20%. That number is 76% today. It's even higher in certain categories of high stakes, high volume cases like evictions. In Washington, D.C., where I live, in 88% of eviction cases, the tenant does not have a lawyer. In 88% of cases where a victim of domestic violence is seeking a protection order, the victim does not have a lawyer. This is happening in the capital of the United States, in the city that has more lawyers per capita than any city on the face of the earth, and a pro bono culture that I think is second to none in the United States. So uh, this is just one indication of how our legal system has failed to ad adapt to a tectonic shift in the identity of its users, a shift away from users who are lawyers overwhelmingly to a world in which the users are overwhelmingly people without 
lawyers. <clears throat> Another statistic that illustrates this phenomenon. In 1973, 54.2% of law firm revenue was coming from individuals. The balance was coming from businesses. In 2017, the last year for which I've seen data, the percentage of law firm revenue coming from individuals was 25.4%. Lawyers have shifted their practices over the last 50 years away from representing individuals and toward representing businesses. The reason is obvious. They're, they're following the money. They're going with the clients who can afford to pay their expensive rates. And those are businesses, not individuals. A few other factoids to illustrate the magnitude of the problem. Every year, an organization called the World Justice Project ranks the countries of the world on their compliance with various indicators of the rule of law. The World Justice Project was co-founded and is uh, today headed by Bill Newcomb, a graduate of this law school. There's a building named after him. I think it's right over there. Uh, he was a longtime general counsel of Microsoft. In the most recent rule of law index issued by the World Justice Project in October of 2022, the United States ranks 115th out of 140 countries on the affordability and accessibility of civil justice. And among the 43 wealthiest countries in the world, the United States ranks 43rd, dead last. Another factoid. Last year, the Legal Services Corporation, where I used to work, issued uh, what they call their Justice Gap Report that attempted to measure the difference between the civil legal needs of low-income people and the resources available to meet those needs. What the study found was that 92% of the civil legal needs of low-income people either get no or inadequate help. But I want to emphasize that that study and its focus on low-income people was looking only at people who are financially eligible for legal aid at the legal aid organizations that the Legal Services Corporation funds. The income eligibility cutoff for legal aid at those organizations is an income at or below 125% of the federal poverty guideline. What that means in 2023 is that if you are an individual, you can't make more than $18,255 a year and qualify for legal aid. $18,255. Here's a news flash. People who make $19,000 a year can't afford a lawyer either. This is a problem that affects the middle class and small businesses, not just low-income people who are financially eligible for legal aid. This point was made in a study issued in 2021 by the Institute for the Advancement of the American Legal System that showed that affordability and accessibility problems run well up the income scale and are not limited to people who are financially qualified for legal aid. So these are just uh, some indications of the magnitude of the, of the problem that we're facing. And the point of our discussion this afternoon, spoiler alert, is we need solutions proportionate to the magnitude of the problem. We have to be thinking really big because the consequences, as Ralph pointed out, are significant. We're talking about the very, uh, the, rule, the rule of law, respect for the, uh, the institutions of justice in the United States. If you want to get a sense of what the threat to the rule of law looks like, you go to one of these courtrooms, Monday through Friday, in any city in the United States, where evictions are heard, where family law cases are heard, custody dis disputes, petitions for orders of protection and domestic violence cases, and you look at the faces of the people in that courtroom who don't have lawyers, and what you will see on their faces is confusion and despair, frustration, sometimes anger. These are the faces of people who have lost 
faith in the American justice system, who don't have any hope of getting a, a fair shake. That's what the demise of the rule of law looks like when people say, the system doesn't work for me. As Jillian Hadfield has said, when people feel as though the rules don't care about them, people don't care about the rules. So uh, what we need is a comprehensive, coordinated, interdisciplinary, interinstitutional approach to tackling this problem. I don't think we have the right people at the table yet. I think lawyers have proven themselves incapable of solving this problem, and we need to bring the benefit of different skill sets and perspectives to, to solving the problem. But I'd like to turn to uh, two people who get it, <laughs> uh, and who in their own institutions, I think, are giving real life examples of how to think differently about solving the problem, and they work with each other. There's no, uh, it's no accident <laughs> that, uh, that Beth and Lisa are on this panel. DLA Piper and Microsoft have a partnership. We need more kinds of relationships like that, where corporate America is teaming with law firms, uh, inter-institutional collaboration to try to deal with big problems. So Lisa, could you uh, tell us something about uh, give us an overview of, of DLA Piper's approach to pro bono. What kind of infrastructure do you have for pro bono? And can you give some concrete examples of the kinds of things that the firm does to try to accomplish systemic improvement as opposed to just handling individual representations? Yes. Um, thank you so much, Jim. And I want to thank Codex and Roland and Megan and everybody who's been involved in and planning this conference. It's a real honor to, to be here and to be sitting next to you and to Beth um, and having this conversation, which is so important. So um, I have, as Jim mentioned, I've had the great privilege and honor of serving as the pro bono partner at DLA Piper for over 20 years. Our mission in the United States is to advance access to justice in our local communities and around the world by promoting gender and racial equality, combating hunger, and advocating on behalf of children. It's a pretty um, big mission, and it's something that we take very seriously. Um, we devote, on average, about 200,000 hours to pro bono every year around the world. And there are many law firms that have incredible and amazing pro bono programs um, and are doing great work. One of the things that I do think makes DLA Piper special is we have one of the largest pro bono teams in the world. The firm has made a pretty extraordinary investment in our pro bono work. So we have close to two dozen full-time pro bono professionals like myself around the world. This allows us to develop systemic projects, as Jim said. It allows us to develop projects that we can replicate, it allows us to be strategic, and it allows us to be proactive when we see crises happening around the world, um, as opposed to just reactive. The crisis is so big that I could sit at my desk and receive emails from legal services providers all day long asking if we can place individual cases. And we do that, and that is so important. But we also do want to be proactive and, and look at systemic change in the way that, um, that Jim alluded to. So I have four examples um, that I'll quickly share with you um, about efforts that we've made. And I'm so happy to be here, by the way, because I want, I want to have other ideas. I want to have other examples to share with you next year. And it's really wonderful to meet so many of you doing incredible work. So my first example, um, the year before uh, the pandemic hit in 2019, DLA Piper hosted a global access to justice and tech summit. And some of you were there, including Professor Hagen and, and Jim. And it was an incredible gathering that truly was international. We had speakers from around the world. It was not a myopic US look at this issue. We understand that we have a lot to learn in the United States from others. And it was great to share information, to hear about exciting projects that were happening all around the world. 
So that was one example, because access to justice is our primary goal, and we know that we need to be using technology more in the pro bono law firm space. The second example is that I um, have the pleasure of serving as a commissioner on the DC Access to Justice Commission, um, where Jim is also a leader of that commission, along with Peter Edelman at Georgetown. And the commission has a project, um, a strategic plan, Justice for All plan, and Grace, who you heard earlier on a panel at the National Center for State Courts, we've also had the great opportunity to work with her. But in part of Im implementing that plan, there are several working groups, and our firm is providing pro bono assistance to the self-help working group, where we're trying to get our arms around all of the self-help materials in the District of Columbia. And believe it or not, even though, I mean, we should be a state, but we are a city, but we have an extraordinary number of legal services providers um, in DC. And so we're trying to get our hands on all of those materials, try to make sense of them, um, come up with the best materials, and make sure that customers, looking at this through the customer lens, recognizing, as Jim shared with you and, and Ralph this morning, these statistics, that not everybody's gonna get a lawyer, but they should be able to have information that they can use to obtain access to justice. So that's, that's a second example. Um, a third is that, um, and Jim mentioned the missing middle, the fact that if you're gonna make $19,000 a year as an individual, you still can't afford a lawyer. We, um, several years ago, al along with Georgetown Law Center and another law firm, Errant Fox, we created a nonprofit law firm. It's called the DC Affordable Law Firm. And it's to meet the needs of DC residents that are in that missing middle. Those who make too much to qualify for legal aid, but still could never afford a lawyer. Those within 200 to 400% of the federal poverty guidelines. We focus on some of the high volume areas, family law, immigration, now probate. It's, um, in, in, really an incredible model. We cannot, still cannot meet the need through this nonprofit law firm. But DLA Piper, not only do we help create it, but we are mentoring the Georgetown Fellows and co-counseling on cases. And then finally, and then I, I know I wanna to turn to Beth, the last example that I would give about systemic reform, as Jim said, we are collaborating with others. Um, and we're collaborating with Microsoft, and it's been such a pleasure to work with Beth on pro bono projects. We are both interested in access to justice and systemic reform, and those kinds of relationships and collaborations are really important, and we wanna do more of that that's interdisciplinary and interinstitutional um, together. So I'll stop there. I want to uh, supplement what Lisa s said about this international conference that they convened in 2019 to bring people together to talk about technology as a tool to uh, advance access to justice. Uh, Lisa was too modest. This was an extraordinary gathering. And among the many things that it illustrated to me was how much we here in the United States have to learn from other countries and not just about technology. One of the lessons of the rule of law index and the United States' is abysmal standing in it is how much we could learn from other countries that do justice better than we do. You hear it said regularly that the United States has the best justice system in the United States, in the, in the world, I'm sorry. We do have the best justice system in the United States. Uh, that may be true on paper, but the, the statistics belie it. Uh, it it's, it's, it's not delivering for the people that the system is in, intended to serve. But that kind of creative thing, I mean, think, what law firm would come up with that idea? I don't know of another law firm that would think at that big a scale uh, to think about uh, how to tackle this problem. They weren't doing it just uh, for the benefit of, of the United States. They were doing it for the benefit of all of the countries where they have offices around the world. So. Um, Beth, can you tell us about Microsoft's approach to, uh, to pro bono, how it got started, uh, what the scope of the pro bono uh, commitment is, it gives some examples of the kinds of things you do at scale to make a difference. Sure, thank you, Jim. Um, it's great to be here today. So you, you may be aware of an organization called Kids in Need of Defense, or KIND for short. Um, if not, 
Microsoft co-founded Kind um, in 2008 with the Hollywood actress Angelina Jolie um, because there was an identified need um, to provide legal support to children who were being placed in immigration proceedings. So immigration in the US is regarded as a civil matter meaning that there is no right to counsel in immigration proceedings. But as we all know, the stakes can be incredibly high uh, when you are facing removal to a country that you fled because you feared for your safety and you're, um, you're at, you, know, you face physical harm if you're returned there. And so what we were seeing in the US in 2008, and the numbers have only dramatically increased since then, was that Children were coming, a large number from the Northern Triangle countries. And based on US law, once they set foot in the US, they are required to go through the immigration process. They can't just be returned. So they have a right to uh, show that they have um, a fear of persecution in their home country. But how do you expect a child to navigate that process? It's hard enough for an adult to navigate the US immigration process. And so Microsoft, um, in collaboration with Angelina Jolie, stood up Kids in Need of Defense, KIND for short, as I mentioned, and with the goal of ensuring that no child would appear in immigration court alone. Well, as I mentioned before, the numbers have significantly increased since then. We're projecting that they will continue to increase. Um, and, you know, we firms like DLA Piper, other law firms in the US are very involved with, with Kind's work. But what we're starting to realize um, is that traditional pro bono hours <laughs> Are not, are not gonna be enough, right, to meet the need. They really never have been enough to meet the need. As Jim has said, we're never gonna be able to volunteer our way out of this issue. And so, and what we've also started to find is that there's a lot of pro bono volunteer fatigue, especially now, I think, you know, when the pandemic first started, we saw a huge uptick in people who were like, I want to help. I, you know, I see people are having a really hard time. I want to get involved. My experience in the pro bono space was, you know, we saw a surge of volunteers who wanted to help. But then, as the pandemic wore on, and you know, people had other obligations, we started to see a drop off. And that's been especially true um, in the immigration-related pro bono space. And I think another reason for that is just how long these cases take. They can take four or five, sometimes longer than that. So now what we're trying to push for is how can you, you know, again, try to engage humans to help with this work, but what are tech solutions out there that could cut down on some of the manual processing that's involved with these cases? So that's, you know, one example. Um, and then since I stepped into the full-time pro bono director role, which um, Jim has said is unusual, and it is, as far as I know as of today, there's only um, three people in total, including myself, who have full-time pro bono director roles in an in-house legal department. Um, we have a lot to do to catch up with law firms. <laughs> um, the bigger law firms are much further ahead of us in developing their pro bono programs. Um, but since I've been able to step in been trying to follow that model of leaning in to where there are gaps, right? Where we're based in um, Washington State, Microsoft's uh, corporate headquarters are in Redmond, Washington. So I really am looking at what's happening in our local community, right? Because that is our priority to be, you know, good partners uh, for our community. And what I identified was a few areas. So, um, Washington is one of the rare states that doesn't have a unified court system. And so it is a hot mess when you try to help somebody with like 
vacating, um, that's the legal terminology, but clearing a conviction from their record. We heard earlier today from the founder of Rosser what they've been able to do in Utah, which is amazing. I wish we could do it in Washington. But we have this fundamental issue of we don't have a unified court system. Every clerk in the local courts does things a little bit differently. So I am trying to tackle how do we start to build solutions to address that. Um, we've also uh, stood up a domestic violence protection order clinic. There are a lot of great tools out there right now and tech solutions that help individuals who have, you know, what is, might be considered like a clear cut domestic violence case, but not everybody fits into that definition. And so what our clinic does is provide representation, full scope representation to individuals who are seeking a protection order. Um, and as you can imagine, when you have to go to court and uh, you have to face the person who's been abusing you, there's an imbalance of power, it can be extremely stressful. So to have somebody by your side to help you um, navigate that process has, you know, is really important, I think. So those are just some of the examples of where we're, again, trying to lean in, where we see gaps and then start to build solutions that start with the traditional delivery of legal services through you know, person to person interaction, but then starting to see where can we infuse this or help make things more efficient by developing tech solutions. Can you say more about, uh, about tech solutions? Uh, I was pleased to hear the discussion earlier this afternoon about the, uh, the enthusiasm um, surrounding uh, GPT-4. Uh, I, I, I think from an access to justice perspective, I think that's a game changer. Uh, we may not be there yet, uh, but I've never heard of, of a project with more potential for improving access to justice. I love what... Um, what Jillian called it, a lawyer in your pocket? How about pocket lawyer? Or, or, <laughs> or, or, or would that be trademark infringement? Uh, but the idea of democratizing law, of, of making the law accessible to, to people, uh, it, that's what we've, we've needed. It, it alone will not be sufficient to solve the access to justice problem, but I, I, I can't imagine a single bigger step than, than something like that. Uh, but... Uh, can you, what can you say about Microsoft's uh, thinking about the use of technology to deal with access to justice problems? I mean, I love, you know, what we talked about today and some of the really, like, sexy technology that's out there and what the, what, what's on the horizon. But what I have learned in this role is that there are a lot of organizations that just need basic tech assistance, right? So Microsoft has a program through our philanthropies program where nonprofit organizations are eligible, eligible to get free or highly discounted access to Microsoft technology. And so we have a lot of, like our pro bono partners, which are nonprofit organizations, legal aid organizations, they're like, great, I wanna get access to it but what do I do with it once I have access to it, right? So what they really need is somebody who can sit down with them and show them um, how they can use, you know, the Office 365 suite of products and how they can, um, you know, get better supported with, like, their data management, their case management, um, you know, building um, more... Uh, secure systems. Um, so a lot of these organizations, they don't have like a dedicated tech worker or, you know, somebody who can provide tech support. So that's one area where we're trying to work with our key pro bono partners to support them with their digital transformation. But we're really starting at a very early stage in that process with them. And then Microsoft, um, does a hackathon annually. So it's three days where everyone in the company is encouraged to set aside their regular work and get involved with a hackathon project. So we have um, 
developed projects in coordination with our key pro bono partners so that they can get some assistance or a project off the ground through these hackathons. And one example was we worked with the Housing Justice Project in King County where we're located. They wanted to build an eviction heat map so then they could use that to show policymakers and other decision makers like where evictions were happening in, our, in the county in real time. And so we were able to get, you know, tech volunteers involved with that project and build out uh, an eviction heat map using, using Power BI. I'm very excited about the potential of chat GPT and AI. I don't think that is the case for many lawyers, unfortunately. Um, I just read a study that LexisNexis did where 60% of the lawyers they surveyed said they have no interest at this time in like really using chat GPT or AI. And so, you know, I just think we have to be realistic about the uh, reluctance that we're seeing by many in the legal profession um, to explore the potential of this of this tech um, but I think you know where what we're trying to explore next you know one of the projects that we're developing right now is how can we support veterans with the discharge upgrade process so a veteran's military file can be literally 10,000 pages, and right now the process is manually go through it and look for certain keywords. So how can we use AI to make that a more efficient process and cut down on the amount of human time involved with that seemingly mundane task? And so, and then how can we start to develop, you know, generative AI models that can create an initial declaration or a brief. And then, again, at least you're then, the pro bono volunteer is stepping in to supplement or develop what's been created by the machine at that point. And I think this will help us not only serve more individuals, but I think it will help us with our volunteer engagement model because it's a selling point if I can say to somebody, it's only gonna take three hours of your time versus 20 hours of your time to help this individual. Um, that can be a real barrier when people think, wait, how much time do you want me to commit to this? So I'm hopeful and I think if we can package it in this positive way, we can start to address some of the reluctance and hesitancy we're seeing in the legal profession about using AI. When we were uh, preparing for this session, we were talking about uh, a wish list uh, or a magic wand, if, if, if we could do one thing, what, what would we like to try to accomplish? And I think uh, where we came out was uh, identifying a multi-part solution uh, to the access to justice problem, uh, and then a plan for implementation. And the components of the, of the plan include regulatory reform, as Ralph discussed this morning, including loosening restrictions on the unauthorized practice of law and repealing or amending Rule 5.4 of the Model Rules of Professional Conduct. Progress is, more progress is being made on the first than on the second uh, currently. Uh, an increasing number of states are adopting or considering the adoption of programs to license professionals who are not lawyers to provide services of a type that would currently be considered the unauthorized practice of law, to create a system analogous to what we have in healthcare, where you have not just doctors, but nurse practitioners and physician's assistants and medical technicians and phlebotomists and pharmacists, who in many states can prescribe medication uh, directly. A second component is process simplification. The legal process, the system in the United States is way too complicated. It doesn't need to be so complicated. It was designed by lawyers, for lawyers, on the assumption that everybody's got a lawyer. That assumption is false. And uh, we can use the discipline of human-centered design that Margaret uh, is using so effectively in, in her work uh, to change uh, the system to make it um, accessible to the true users of the system, the public who don't have lawyers. Third, we need to think about legislative solutions. The access to justice movement is not so great about thinking about 
legislative uh, solutions. Their approaches are usually very court-centric, uh, but there are uh, potential legislative fixes. One of them is regulatory. Uh, there is a move afoot in North Carolina, for example, to deal with licensing paraprofessionals through a legislative change. The requirement that only lawyers can provide legal services in North Carolina is a matter of statute. The legislature can change that, uh, that statute, and efforts are underway to make that happen. Why? Uh, because efforts to go through the bar were unsuccessful. Um, next, uh, we need to think about deploying technology at scale to democratize law. Uh, we've made some progress in that up, up until this point, but we've been stymied, I think, by our system of federalism in the United States. Most of the legal issues that affect low-income people or middle-income people, most of the legal issues that affect individuals are matters of state law, not federal. So when you come up with a tech solution that works for one kind of case in one state, you've got a solution that works for one kind of case in one state. It's not transferable to other states. You've got to do it 50 times over, and sometimes even more than that in states that don't have unified court systems where you may have different processes in, different count, in every different county in the state, and sometimes different processes in every different courtroom in the same courthouse. Uh, Next, we need to think about uh, uh, redesigning pro bono. Uh, not to do any less of individual representation, but to rethink pro bono to encompass systemic improvement, uh, to think at scale about how we uh, might deploy pro, pro bono resources to make the system better. Next, uh, we need to get corporate America <clears throat> on board. Uh, this is a rule of law issue, and the uh, um, business community in America should care about this. I think the case can be made very effectively, particularly through general counsel of the, um, of the largest corporations in the country. And finally, we need to figure out a better way to get uh, more people to the table, uh, people with different skill sets than lawyers alone have, different perspectives. I think we can learn a lot from healthcare, we can learn from engineers, we can learn from business people, uh, we can learn from social workers. Uh, the projects that I work on at the University of Pennsylvania are uh, cross school and uh, we find uh, great enthusiasm for the projects we undertake in the law school to improve access to justice in other schools across the university. No one's ever asked them before, but they're, uh, they're happy to get involved. But here's the challenge. Who's gonna pull this all together? What we need is a strategic blueprint. What we need is a meta-collaboration to improve access to justice. Who is going to own that? No one owns it today. If you think someone does, raise your hand and tell me. I, uh, <laughs> uh, and think of this maybe as a homework assignment. Who could own this? I think it has to be some entity that has both credibility and authority. Any self-appointed group of people who try to take it on are going to be met with the who died and left you in charge re response. It will be difficult for them to get acceptance of what they propose. But I think we need to think hard about what uh, entities, maybe not a single one, but maybe a collaboration of entities would have the heft and the commitment and the passion to, to deal uh, with these issues. That's the only way it's gonna happen. It's not gonna happen piecemeal. It will take forever. When I think about the, the approaches that we're using today to improve access to justice, I ask myself, in what year, in what decade, in what century are they going to be effective in improving access to justice? That's a, that's a question we should be asking. Do we have a target date? And if not, why not? And if we have one, how are we gonna get there by that, by that date? But I think that's a, a question that really deserves serious thought. The uh, not my problem answer isn't, isn't gonna work. Um, it's all of our, our problem. We'd be happy to answer questions. Yes. Uh, 
increasingly arbitration, which I think is the um, preferred method now for resolving disputes between individuals and businesses. Yeah, so the question, uh, if you didn't hear it, was uh, there's been talk about using uh, technology to improve um, access in the courts, but what about alternative dispute resolution? And uh, my answer is I, I, I don't know of anything specific, but I'm really optimistic because uh, Bridget Mary McCormick, uh, who was until very recently the Chief Justice of Michigan, uh, just became the CEO of the American Arbitration Association. And uh, Bridget uh, had a long history at the University of Michigan Law School heading their clinical programs. She's an access to justice warrior. She gets it. And I think one of the things that intrigued her about the position at the American Arbitration, Arbitration Association was the chance to do exactly that, to improve, to you begin to use uh, the, 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 the AAA, I, I think of as, as a business, uh, business to business uh, type, type entity. Uh, I believe she has a different vision uh, for the American Arbitration Association and she has the right experience and the right mind uh, to be able to address exactly that question. Hi, thank you so much. I appreciate the panelists' thoughts. I was wondering if you could comment a bit on the issue of consumer choice. We talk a lot about legal aid and pro bono in terms of people who can afford it, but there are people who can afford legal services through an attorney but do not want to. How are we getting away with this entire judiciary, sometimes delegated to bar associations, dictating that if you can afford a lawyer, you have to have a lawyer? I would love your thoughts. Thank you. I'll, I'll take that one. <laughs> uh, your question to me raises a, 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 a broad issue about how the rules get made and who participates in the rulemaking process. The legal system belongs to the people. It doesn't belong to the lawyers. But lawyers set the rules for the system. And uh, when they set the rules, uh, when there are uh, rulemaking proceedings, they usually follow a process that includes an, a, a so-called opportunity for notice and public comment. But public participation in the setting of the rules that govern the legal system is absolutely minimal. And it's no surprise because the mechanisms that lawyers use to notify the public of potential changes and to solicit their input include things like posting on bar and court websites. Real people with real lives don't lurk around court and bar websites looking for things to comment on. <laughs> if, if you're looking to give the appearance of seeking public input without getting it, that's how you do it. I think it's in, this, in some of the states that have uh, adopted regulatory reform to loosen restrictions on the unauthorized practice of law, the reason they succeeded was because there was a real opportunity for public input. And when the public voice was heard, you got a different result from the one you would have gotten had lawyers been driving the train. Uh, a good example is Arizona, which does have a licensed paraprofessional program and, and along with Utah, leads the nation in, in regulatory reform. They went about a process of having town halls, focus groups. They did a survey of the public. They prepared educational videos. They did this all within the course of less than a year, as I recall. And they got meaningful public input. The public input was so powerful in support of regulatory change that it flipped the vote of the Board of Governors of the Arizona State Bar from majority opposed to change to majority in favor. And, and what the way Arizona went about it, I think, created a blueprint that other states could use. If you're stymied, at how, how would we go about getting public input? Call Arizona. They, they, they've, they've got it in a box and, and you can, uh, can adopt it. Uh, but, uh, but I think until, uh, I don't see a solution to the problem you raised, Natalie, unless, un until there's a, uh, a, an opportunity for meaningful public input. And I think any efforts at regulatory reform have to build that in. The process by which the reform gets considered is critically important. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, hello, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, my background is in engineering, and the challenge of changing the rules for the ABA looks like it's impossible. Is there a way to invert the model, um, to look for a way around? For example, if computer scientists had an accelerated law program. Now, I mentioned this because in engineering, we had a problem reforming mathematics education because it wasn't serving engineers. And we did create a program of engineering mathematics which went around the mathematics department. And the same thing happened at Stanford. The computer science department was in the mathematics department, but they chose to go into the engineering department um, because of the opposition. So I am curious if you know of any, I think the Arizona case is an interesting one, but we can, um, I mean, there are ways around the system when a system doesn't want to move, and I, I, I think it's really, you're talking about the need for a revolution. So I'm curious if you have That's any a, cases. That's why we need people like you in the room. <laughs> I love the way you think. You're asking exactly the right, lawyers don't ask that question. <laughs> that, uh, uh, that, that's, I mean, I find when I talk to people in other professions about the access to justice problem in the United States, first of all, it just blows their mind. That, I mean, they, they don't understand the concept that you have no right to a lawyer in a civil case. Um, they're fascinated by it. And they have lots of, they ask questions lawyers don't ask. They see analogies to, to their own experiences, like you do. Uh, how do you solve the unsolvable problem that, that, that arises in lots of, of disciplines? I don't know the answer to your question, but I think that we won't be able to answer it until we have many more people like you and with, with different backgrounds looking at our problem and helping us solve it. Lawyers created this mess, and, and we're not gonna dig ourselves out of it alone. We need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, so I'm, my name is Billy Daly. Um, I kind of come more from also an engineering background, uh, working <laughs> sort of in civic tech. Thank you so much. Um, working in civic technology, I really appreciated the question or sort of the challenge that you put to the group at the end um, of you know what does this cohort of uh, change agents look like? Um, and I think that it's a valuable question that we collectively should answer. But I'm really curious to get the panel's perspective. Uh, maybe not individual agencies or, or organizations or, or companies, but what do you feel like would be sort of the minimum set of characteristics or populations that should be represented in that kind of cohort? It, do you see sort of you know critical uh, representation that needs to be a, a part of that sort of cohort of, of change agents? Huh. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm from a law firm, obviously. I think, I think the private sector has a real role to play. Um, we have uh, pro bono programs, and we're devoting an extraordinary, extraordinary um, resources to this issue. And I think when you have pro bono programs like Beth and I have and are directing, you also see the issues up close. And I think, I always think of a quote from Brian Stevenson from Just Mercy, if anybody's read it, like, and it's to understand, to truly understand an issue, you need to have proximity. You need to, you need to be close to it. And so I think there is real value in, um, in pro bono so that people can see it up close. And the way Jim described walking into a landlord-tenant court or an eviction court and seeing that, I think, um, will inspire more people to, to join in this movement. And I recognize I'm not completely answering your question, but I do think you know, the private sector certainly, firms, companies, um, bar associations, other professionals, um, other schools, like the way um, Professor Hagen and, and Jim described how they're collaborating with other schools. So certainly academia. Um, and, and I think it would be wonderful to have engineers to, you know, and others to kind of help us think through kind of the structural issues and challenges to really achieve that kind of reform. Um, 
I think you also so, need yeah. representation from the individuals who are directly impacted as mm -hmm. well, because yeah. we have our own perception as the individuals who are advocating or trying to assist, but their lived experience, they have the mm -hmm. direct uh, experience of what that was like. And so, you know, there's individuals who have gone through the process are now on the other side of it. And I think their input is critical and should, you know, would need to be a part of this. That's an excellent point. I would think about both um, expertise and perspectives that you need, and I think about individual people. I think th this is a project that needs to be led by leaders, uh, by people who have vision and passion and who get it. And a few names come to mind. People I'd, I'd love to pick their brain, Bridget Mary McCormick, I, I think, who I think just did a spectacular job of Chief Justice uh, of Michigan. She, she understood. Uh, the opportunity that she had as the Chief Justice of the state to, uh, to improve the system, uh, not just as a decider of cases, but as the administrator of the third branch of government. Um, I'd want to involve Ken Frazier. Uh, Ken Frazier is the former CEO of Merck, the pharmaceutical company. He's a lawyer. He came up through the, the ranks. Um, Ken is remarkable for many reasons, among them, uh, he did a death penalty case while he was working in-house as a lawyer at Merck, and he got his client exonerated after 18 years on death row for a crime he didn't commit. Uh, Ken understands the rule of law from the perspective of a CEO of a global uh, corporation. He gets it. I would, uh, Matthew Desmond, um, uh, who wrote the book Evicted and just came out with a new book about poverty in the United States. I, 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 I'd love to pick his, his brain about a, a subject like this. And I think it's critically important to have the users of the system represented and not represented through people speaking for them. Uh, not having legal aid lawyers be the ones who speak for the people they represent. Hear from the people directly. They're perfectly capable of speaking for themselves. They have their own voices and they, they need to be heard. So I'd, um, I should have been prepared to answer your question. It's exactly the right, the right <laughs> question. Those are just some off the top of my head reactions. Maybe let, let's have that be the final question because we're half an hour over time. So <laughs> <laughs> Try and be quick. And then we should be okay. close uh, at six. Okay, <laughs> two minutes. Close the bar, which would be All right, right. don't yeah, cut into my time. <laughs> um, <laughs> hello, my name is Annabelle. I'm a barrister from Australia and I went to law school very idealistic, access to justice. Um, I did a law apps class in my last year, which really changed the way I sort of understood the justice system and, and how we deal with it. And then I went on a traditional litigation path and I worked with a judge at the Supreme Court and then I became a barrister. And it's quite interesting sort of hearing the things that we're talking about today as if, you know, law systems are written by lawyers for lawyers. And it's very, very true. When I think about my own experiences, both in the court and as an advocate, self-reps can be incredibly painful, both to deal with when you're in a courtroom, because we are all very high-level thinkers. We speak in a certain way. We're trained in a certain way. And then suddenly you're put with a lay person, and they don't have that education. They don't have the background that you have, and they slow the process down. We also all work at a very fast pace, so we're frustrated when the when the process gets slowed. Um, being a barrister, being opposed to a self-rep is like the hardest thing in the world. You can't get in anywhere with them and even if you feel sorry for them, you're actually not, you're not allowed to help them at all. You're actually their adversary. You're there to win for your client against them. And one thing that I've sort of been thinking about for a while is like legal wellness. Like you know in the medical industry how like wellness is such a a thing now where self-education, preventative care, have a green juice, look after your gut health, like educate people on the things that make us sick before we get sick. We don't really have that in the legal industry. We just have people living their lives, they have a problem, they don't know how to fix the problem, they try and see a lawyer, they try and navigate a legal system, they don't understand it, it moves far quicker than they can comprehend it and then it spits them out because they can't keep up. So I don't know how to deal with that problem. I've kind of always thought about when I was especially associate at the court, like how the Supreme Court in Australia can help with that, how education can be part of, you know, the general population's lives so that they're actually empowered to be their own advocates and speak for themselves. 
But that's a huge mission. I don't know how to do it, and I would wonder if anyone else has ever thought like that. So. All right. All right, well, let's, uh, since there was no specific question, I think, for the panel, uh, I think that's a good place to close here. We are half an hour uh, over time. Uh, the bar is still open, so please join us for some drinks uh, outside. Uh, I think this was a full day, uh, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. Uh, thank you so much to the panel. Thank you, Jim, Lisa, and Beth. Thank you to all the speakers today. Thank you to you all for joining us at Stanford today. And um, yeah, let's have some drinks. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>